Good good morning, church. It is great to see you. I, I think spring has sprung. Would you agree with that? No, I think I might have said that once before. I don't know. <laughs> it's the first spring we've had since 2017. If you don't remember, last year we went straight from winter right into summer. There was no spring at all. Delighted to welcome you here to this service. Let's center ourselves on God and greet him in his house this morning. I'm tired, I'm worn, my heart is heavy from the work it takes to just keep breathing. I've made mistakes, I've let my hope fail, my soul feels crushed by the weight of this world. And I know that you can give me rest. So I cry out with all that I have left. Let me see redemption win. Let me know the struggle ends. You can mend a heart that's frail and torn. I want to know a song can rise from the ashes of a broken life and all that's dead inside can be reborn cause I'm worn yeah I'm I know I need to lift my eyes up, but I'm too weak. Life just won't let up, and I know that you can give me rest. So I cry out with all that I have left. Let me see redemption win. Let me know the struggle ends. You can mend a heart that's frail and torn. I want to know a song can rise from the ashes of a broken life. And all that's dead inside can be reborn. Cause I'm worn, my prayers are wearing thin. Yeah, I'm worn, even before the day begins. Yeah, I'm worn, I've lost the will to fight. I'm worn, so heaven come and flood my eyes. Let me see redemption win. Let me know the struggle ends. You can mend a heart that's frail and torn. I want to know a song can rise from the ashes of a broken life. And all that's dead inside can be reborn. Cause all that's dead inside can be reborn. Cause I'm worn. Yeah, I'm worn. So how busy are you? Do you find yourself running around ragged, unable to keep up with all the demands? Are you spending your time 
on the important things or just reacting to life. All of us at one time in our lives have found ourselves in the position of feeling anxious about not having enough time or just being with the ones that we treasure. Then when we do, we wonder why it took us so long to carve out the time because we remember that those connections can feed our souls. Our scripture today reminds us that sometimes we should let go of the things that seem very important for the things that are even more important. Let's focus for a few moments, slow down a little, finding our quiet center. Come and find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are free. Clear the chaos and the Again this week, I invite you to take a deep breath. Last week, I, I think I said, if you have a watch on, I invite you to, to turn it around. And if you, have a, if you have a phone with the time on it, turn it over or put it away. And I know that caused some anxiousness. That's okay. Pay attention to those feelings. And let these simple acts, or maybe not so simple acts, be a sign of the commitment to give ourselves a break, to give ourselves just, just an hour or even a little less to catch our breath, to give ourselves and to give God some attention. At this time, I invite you to stand if you're able and join me for our clearing out prayer this morning. Would you stand please? Dear God, we come today hungry for company. Draw us into this time of worship to sit down at the place you have prepared for us. Help us clear out the calendar of our lives to make room for others in it. Let us be room for you. In the name of Jesus who invites us to wholeness. Amen. Would you remain standing as we sing our opening hymn? Praise 
church, before you're seated, would you share a word of greeting with those around you in the name of Christ's love?
Thank you, choir. Thank you. Good morning. I have a couple of things I want to share with you very quick before we continue. Um, first of all, um, I had a bunch of people at first service say, where's Pastor Allison? Is she sick? She's taking a couple of days at spring break, and, and her kids are off, and so she's, she's taking a little time to take a breath today. And so we, we keep her in prayer, and we're thankful for her. Um, also... Um, our purpose today is to take a pause, and the message is about taking a pause sometimes from things that are important for things that might be more important. And so we're going to pause right now to take just a moment to celebrate something that, that for us at St. Paul's is very important. Uh, you might notice Aaron's not here today either. This is why... Uh, Dad's still in the back, though. This is Soren Jameson, 8 pounds, 13 ounces. Um, TR, this is very soon after delivery, right? And Mom's in full makeup. It doesn't look like it was much labor at all. I'm saying that because she's probably watching, and I want to know. So, so keep that family in prayer. I've told her to take the whole week off. So we'll see how... Uh, <laughs> Uh, what a wonderful celebration. Congratulations to the Hefley family. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, one more thing I, I do want to say. Um, a couple of weeks ago, when on one of our snow apocalypse days, uh, when we cut down to one service, we still had 60 or 65 people that were able to be here. I talked about our general conference, our special called General Conference of the United Methodist Church on a discussion that is a very difficult discussion. Many denominations have gone through this, and we're, we're in the middle of it on human sexuality and, and how we move forward with that and if we can do so as one body and kind of the future of the United Methodist Church. And, and I've had a lot of people asking me questions, so this is what I would like to do. Next Sunday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm going to be here, and we're going to, we're going to open this for a conversation. So if this is something that, that you're hurt over, that you have a question about, I invite you to come, and we will have an open conversation. Our bishop is making nine stops around the state, and he was at Independence um, yesterday, and several of us went up there and listened to what he had to say about it. And I would like to share some of that, but kind of outside of worship so that we can honor those that were here that day and watched online. So two o'clock, and then I'm going to ask you for a little favor. This is a conversation for us. I, I spoke to Aaron before and said, please don't put this all over Facebook. I, I don't want this to be an opportunity for other folks who are not part of this to come and 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 criticize or that's not what it's for i just want to have a conversation and let everybody be heard is that is that fair so if you have someone that's not here today that's that's should be part of this conversation i invite you to bring them next uh next sunday at two in the afternoon i thank you for that our scripture today is from uh from the book of luke the 10th chapter of uh, four short verses that that say so much Verses 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, he, that would be Jesus, entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and she asked, Lord, you don't care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is, uh, this is an interesting scripture. Because I have served a church over the several, many churches I've served. Um, one, two, three, four, five. This is the sixth church I've served in my ministry. And one of them had a group called the Martha Group. And that was the group of, it was ladies, and when something, when work needed to be done, they were the ones that did it. They were the ones that helped with the funeral meals and, and the potlucks. It was the Martha group. They were the doers. 
And, and as I read the scripture, I, I think back about the wonderful people in that group. And then I look at what Jesus had to say about it. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Most people that I know um, consider Jesus to be a pretty fair guy. Amen? Is that fair? Pretty fair. At least till we get to this story. I've heard more people on different sides of this story, so I want to address it. One day, Jesus is visiting a village, a certain village, and Martha welcomes him into her home. What is she doing? She's setting up an ancient equivalent of a meet and greet, folks. That's really what this is. Her, her, her house is probably packed with people who are curious, local villagers, who have been hearing stories about this traveling preacher named Jesus, and they're hearing it from someone who heard it from someone who might have been at somewhere where he was. Remember, no Facebook, no internet, right? And now they had the opportunity to actually put their eyes on him to see this man that people are talking about and to be able to make up their own mind and to, and to hear him speak to try to see for themselves, is this the person that people are claiming that it might be? And then Martha, as the convener of the party, the organizer, or the party planner, if you will, she's got quite a job ahead of her, right? Ancient hospitality customs dictate that she needs to make the guests feel at home, and that would include providing food and drink. Some things haven't changed so much over the years, have they? And much like today, Martha's close friends, I'm sure, would chip in to help, especially in those times the female relatives would have been expected to help her out in the kitchen while the others re recline and enjoy the conversation. So Martha's running around, putting cheese plates together, gathering olives and figs and dates and putting them into bowls, Right? Probably making hummus and baking flat bread and filling water pitchers and wine glasses. Can't you picture it? And as she works, she expects her sister Mary to be helping her, and she's looking around, where is Mary? And she looks in, and Mary is just pretty content, sitting right at the feet of Jesus, listening to every word that he says. And Martha gets a little bit upset. That doesn't seem fair. After waiting expectantly for Mary's help, Martha begins to fume, and, and then she runs in and bursts out in front of everybody. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Tell her to help me. One might expect Jesus to have a little bit of compassion for the host who's gone to great lengths and great expense to host this event. One might even envision Jesus gently scolding Mary or reminding her, you know, that we should do unto others or it's better to give than to receive. Why don't you go try that a little bit? That's not what happens, is it? No, instead of scolding Mary, Jesus, Jesus speaks to Martha. And he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. And there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Many people who read this passage object to the way Jesus handles the situation. They passionately defend Martha, asking why Jesus doesn't, doesn't seem to have even the least bit of sympathy for someone who's throwing a party for him and working her tail off to provide hospitality on his behalf. Martha has to work twice as hard because her sister is just sitting idly by, listening to Jesus as if she's one of the invited guests. Surely Martha would have loved a few moments at Jesus' feet also, but she was too busy taking care of everybody else, including her sister. And how did Jesus describe Martha? Worried and distracted. 
That's what Jesus sees when he looks at Martha, who's running around fussing about all the things that are being done in the background. He sees a busy and distracted person. We can all imagine the hurt that must have been felt by Martha and being called out in that way, can't we? I mean, we ourselves, we run around from activity to activity, obligation to obligation, all because we're, we're just trying to be good people. We're trying to put food on the table. We're trying to live as a respectable contributors to society. We're just trying to do our best to get everything done that needs to be done. Hopefully, somewhere in there, we're trying to be good disciples of Jesus. And then we hear Jesus scolding us when he says, you're worried and distracted by many things. And we want to say, but Lord, we were just doing what we thought you wanted us to do. If everyone were like Mary, would any, anybody ever get any work done? We'd all be sitting idly by expecting somebody else to do all the hard work. Only nobody else would, right? To privilege Mary over Martha seems like the ultimate in the lack of wisdom, or, or at least in the lack of, of good judgment. Endorsing a whole system that would make people feel entitled to get what they want without working for it. We hear that a lot. Well, folks, catch your breath if you're adding your voice to those objections. Because I think one mistake we we constantly make probably more than any other mistake with Jesus is is taking his words which were uttered at a particular time in a particular contextual situation for a particular people at a particular moment and thinking that he was speaking to every time and every person and every situation as a matter of fact folks that may be the main reason the United Methodist Church is, is having conversations like we're having today. Because we pick and choose a situation in Scripture and say, he said it then, he must have meant it for all time. Let me remind you, there are many situations in the Bible where different messages were given to different people at different times. For example... In one scripture, Jesus sends his disciples out and he tells them to venture into the countryside carrying no bag, no purse, no sandals. That would make people think he's speaking about all, all disciples and maybe we're all supposed to get rid of everything we have in order to be a true follower, right? That's what St. Francis thought. Yet in another passage, Jesus tells his disciples, take your bags Take your purse. And if you, if you have a sword, take it. And if you don't have a sword, go get one. That's Luke 22, in case you want to check me on that. While Jesus' words of wisdom tend to stand for all time, that doesn't mean that we can ignore a particular situation that he's sharing his thoughts in and think that it applies to every other situation of every other kind that might be similar. Think about our present story for a moment as if it happened today. Imagine that Jesus were literally coming to your home to discuss his thoughts about life. What do you think would be more important for you to do? Make sure everybody got brownies and coffee or, or make sure everybody, including yourself, was able to feast on the word of what Jesus had to say. Remember, this is Jesus we're talking about, not, not a philosopher. In Martha's day, she couldn't simply say, you know what, there, somebody's going to tape it. I'll watch it later. You couldn't even, you can't even pull up Jesus videos on YouTube, could you? You've got one opportunity. He's there. He's in the house. It might be the only opportunity she will ever have to hear him speak in such a small, intimate setting. You know what? Is the pita bread really that important? Of course, Martha might object that it was out of her high respect for Jesus that she sacrificed her opportunity to sit at his feet and to provide him with a few figs and dates. Yet, I would ask you this. 
How respected do you suppose someone like Jesus would feel to have someone else basically say, I would love to listen to you, but you know what? I need to go work on the cheese plates. Was it not Jesus that actually said to the, once told the devil, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And he said that after going without food for 40 days. In privileging Mary's idleness over Martha's work, Jesus was not saying that idleness is an ideal goal. That's not the message here. Or putting down work is unnecessary. He was just simply talking about keeping the main thing the main thing. What is really the most important thing at a given time? And don't let yourself be so distracted by the small things that we miss the main thing. When he was speaking, the main thing was to set aside whatever you were doing and to spend time listening. How else were were his words to be heard and, and remembered and passed on from generation to generation if we're too busy in the kitchen? There's a book by Eugene Peterson called The Contemplative Pastor where Peterson speaks to one of the largest communities of of Martha's on earth, Christian ministers. Many ministers take pride in being busier than the average person and, and then letting people know just how busy they are. Yet Peterson says this is craziness. He compares the best work of a pastor to a particular person in Herman Melville's Moby Dick. The question is, I guess, should his comments only refer to a pastor? Let me share his writing in this one paragraph. In Herman Melville's Moby Dick, there's a turbulent scene in which a whale boat scuds across the frothing ocean in pursuit of the great white whale, Moby Dick. The sailors are laboring fiercely, every muscle taut, all attention and energy concentrated on the task at hand. The cosmic conflict between good and evil is joined. Chaotic sea and demonic sea monster versus the morally outraged Captain Ahab. In this boat, however, is one man who does nothing. He doesn't hold an oar. He doesn't doesn't even work up a sweat. He doesn't shout. He doesn't struggle. He sits silently. This man is the harpooner. He's quiet and he's poised, listening and waiting all of his attention on the job that he has been given. And then we see this sentence. To ensure the greatest efficiency in the dart... The harpooners of this world must jump to their feet out of idleness, not out of toil. In each of our lives as individuals, there's a time and and a place where we need to be rowing. And there's a time when we need to to be ready to harpoon. Sometimes you've got to buckle down and and trudge and in any way that you possibly can with all the energy you have. And at other times, you need to set the oar down no matter how many people complain that you're shirking your responsibility. And you need to stop. And you need to breathe. And you need to look around. And you need to listen. And if you don't do that, you may miss whatever you were rowing so fervently to catch. Or worse... That which lies beneath the turbulent sea may come up from under you and turn your boat over. It's a difficult concept for some folks. We've been taught that idleness is is similar to laziness. Remember the line we were all brought up with, idle hands are devil's workshop, right? I think that that might be referring to too much idleness. And I think we've come to learn that too much of anything can be harmful. But pausing to stop, to think, to pray, to wait for direction, to be more aware of what is happening around you, of what is really important. Taking breaks like this, I think, are incredibly helpful, and I believe that we need 
this harpooner time more than once or twice a year. That's why God commands us to take a, a Sabbath day each week. It's also why God commands us to spend time listening to the Spirit's voice every day in prayer and meditation. It might also be why we spend a third of our life sleeping. We need time to pause and to rest. Spending time in rest is vital, not just when you're working hard, but also when you're, when you're stressed and worried about those looming catastrophes that we know are just around the corner, whether personal or global. Our instinct in times of crisis is always to get busy and to hold on to any scrap of security we can find instead of pausing and waiting for God. The story of Mary and Martha suggests a different approach, that instead of running around worried and distracted by many things, there's times we need to stop, breathe, look around, listen. Listen to each other as children of God and listen for God in the world around us. Take that time to reconnect with an unhurried God as we spend time in his presence. Today we will do that again through our, our prayer chair. We've replaced our table this time during Lent with a prayer chair. And I've invited each of you to, to think about designating a chair at home and on the back of your, your little bulletin slip is a prayer that, that I've put down that pertains to today's message. You can use that as a starting place. Spend a little bit of time with God. Pause from the busyness that we all find ourselves in. Today, we do that also and again. We pause, we break, we pray and we listen. I invite you to join me as we, as we begin with a time of silence. Let's pray. It's okay to try to find words that fill the silence in your head. It's okay if the thoughts won't quiet down. Just take a pause. There's no place that we need to be and nothing is expected of you right now. Just stillness. Just be. Silence is a friend who claims us, cools the heat and slows the pace. God it is who speaks and names us, knows our being, touches base. Making space within our thinking, lifting shades to show the sun, raising courage when we're shrinking, finding scope for faith begun. Heavenly Father, for the times when we have put the to-do list before reaching out to others, forgive us. For the times when we have isolated ourselves to, to just push through it, God, forgive us. Help us find the place of balance, Lord. Help us to be mindful of our need and others' need to be in relationship. Help us stop and find that relationship with you as you invite us to beautiful and serene moments of life. In this moment, we hear your promise. There is a place for you and plenty to go around. You don't ask us to work to earn a place at your table. We are your children. 
And that comes with a never-ending invitation regardless. We bring our petitions at this time, God. We open our hearts and we lift up the prayers that lie within. God, hear the people and the things that we're worried about and yet know that we cannot control. And now, Heavenly Father, we lift our voices together with the prayer that Jesus taught us all when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we pause from this this service to give our hearts and our, our offerings to God, I invite you to join me as we bless all that we're about to receive for Christ's holy work. Would you join me, please? In the confidence that you will multiply our best efforts, we bring our offerings for the work of your church in the world. Holy God, it is a joy to present our sacrifices, for we are as blessed in our giving as we have been in receiving abundant goodness from your hand. Keep us from seeking to get so much done that we miss the main thing. For us, as a prepare for the offering, please. Precious Lord, take my hand.
our service today the final the final act is a time to commit to take a little bit of of this place into a busy world reminded to keep the main thing the main thing and now may your life be emptied of of meaningless rambling and may be filled with meaningful encounters and may you be reacquainted each day with an unhurried God that invites us to dive deeper in love with him in the name of Christ Amen. In the Spirit, let us travel open to each other's Good morning. 